Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's, uh, it's actually my first webinar, so, or at least of this kind. I had other, of course, uh, event, but I've never had one webinar with all these young people, so I'm very excited about that. So thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, so a few words about myself. Um, I'm currently the Vice Provost for Research of the Grand Salsa Science Institute. I'm also the director of the area of social sciences and I'm full professor of applied economics. Previously, I was a professor of economics at Ohio State University, where I stayed for seven years in the Department of Agriculture, Environmental and Development Economics. And before that, I actually spent 11 years in the UK. I was a, a, a reader at the University of Southampton and before that I was a lecturer at the University of Reading, where I did also my PhD. Um, I'm a regional economist. I started in Italy. I'm Italian, of course. That's why I came back to Italy eventually. Um, and I, my main research uh, has been since the time of my PhD, which is now long ago, uh, human capital. So my background is a little bit closer to labor economics. So human capital, uh, regional development, of, of course, and migration. So what I started doing about uh, 20 years ago now, because I started my PhD in 2000, um, was studying the migration behavior of highly educated people, right? So that's, and I started in the UK because I had very good data there, and I'll talk about that in my presentation. And then from there, you know, I started working also in other contexts. So I did some work in Australia, in the US, of course, when I went to the US, uh, currently I'm doing things in Italy as well. I also have other topics that I've been working uh, on and I'm still working on. One is regional resilience, uh, especially after the crisis. This became such a, a buzzword that everybody now is working on regional resilience, except that we are particularly interested being L'Aquila, an intermediate region, not in urban re uh, resilience, but in kind of more intermediate peripheral areas. So that's one thing we are working on. Of course, L'Aquila was also the city that was struck by a natural disaster, the earthquake in 2009. So we are also interested not just about resilience uh, after economic recession crisis, but also after shocks such as natural disasters. Um, we just won in Horizon 2020 to map the creative and cultural industries in the UK. So that's another topic that we are currently working on at the GSSI. I do have a rather large group I mean, I came back in February 2017, eventually for good. And uh, right now I have 13 postdocs and uh, six faculty members and 30 PhD students. So we are a, a large group. And so the topics are very different, but these are some of the topics that we're actually currently um, working on. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to talk about today, when you ask me what I wanted to talk about, uh, I kind of took the easy way out because this has been what I've been working on for the past 20 years, which is graduate migration and regional development. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about, I always uh, suggest to, to, you know, the, the young researcher, uh, and so I'm doing this myself as well, to actually ask yourself uh, and probably put it in the introduction as well. Why do we care about certain things? So I think that the reason why we should at least care about graduate migration are kind of obvious um, in the sense that uh, graduates bring human capital into a country, a region, an area, right? And there are now plenty of contributions that point out that human capital is essential for growth and development. It's not the only ingredient, uh, don't get me wrong. It, I think it's a necessary, not sufficient ingredient, but it's definitely a necessary one. Because sure, you can have capital, you can have technology, you can have all these things, but if you don't have the absorptive capacity of individuals to actually get these to work, you go nowhere. So I think human capital and knowledge should be the starting point in a lot of situations. Of course, it's difficult to bring human capital into a region if you don't have jobs. And there is, there is all this debate of, you know, people following jobs or jobs following people. But really, you have to start somewhere. And I think that human capital, it's a good starting point and also a good investment for your money. 
Uh, here I just pointed out some of the few more recent uh, work that I read on this idea of the human capital fostering innovation. Of course, I cited some of my own work with Professor McCann back in, in 2009 in the UK, but Abel and um, Deitz, for instance, in 2012, talked about you know, a region human capital being one of the strongest predictor of the economic vitality of a region. And uh, Florida, well, he did a lot of work on creativity Activity actually more than human capital, but again, he's pointing out to this uh, idea that uh, if you want innovation, uh, economic and population growth, that's what you want. You want, you know, some kind of knowledge. Uh, and of course, linked to this uh, 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 idea of human capital and, uh, and uh, migration, there is also this idea of knowledge spillovers and externalities. You bring people, skill labor, skill pool labor, create some kind of local knowledge spillover that help with future growth. So, uh, as I said before, in my own work, I was looking at attraction and retention of graduates into a region. And one of my articles that came from my PhD was actually looking at this, what we call the human capital effect. What has been pointing out is that there are like spin-offs, spillovers from universities, but uh, these spin-offs and spillovers in reality are rather limited in quanti quantitative terms. What it's really the effect sometimes of universities on a territory is this long-term effect of bringing these very highly educated people in, especially if you then do manage to retain them in the local area. Um, moreover, we should care about this graduate migration because uh, this mobility of highly human capital people is not slowing down. And there is no actually sign that it will slow down in the future. I always like to give you a sense of the numbers here, right? So in 2013, the UNESCO published the statistic that says that about 2% of students globally are enrolled in a tertiary education that is not in their home country. So two in 100 is not small, it's over 4 million people. So imagine what kind of potential you could get if you can get these people like to be in your own region, in your own country. People are mobile, especially young people. And I'm gonna talk about this uh, later on in the slides at the end. Of course, in this process, there are winners and losers. You always hear about the kind of brain drain on the side of the losers and of course, the large city urban environments are gaining a lot of highly educated people as the winners of these, right? Uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. And of course, uh, there are language advantages. So uh, English speaking countries remain the most popular for attracting these highly educated student graduates uh, workers. But there are other hubs that are kind of, you know, emerging around the world. Uh, and again, to reiterate a point, attracting these international students is really critical in, in your run to become competitive in the world. Right, so um, before I actually mention this global size survey, uh, let me tell you that actually my specialty is not international migration. I am working a little bit now on refugees and of course international migration. But when I was looking at the mobility of graduates, I was more interested in the regional dimension. So I was looking at interregional migration within countries because I'm a regional economist, not an international economist. But I cannot give an overview talk without talking about also a little bit of the macro scale, which is the international migration. And I think that this Franzoni et al study of 2012 is interesting because it's kind of the first systematic study Oops, sorry. I, okay, the first systematic study um, of scientists around the world. And as you can imagine, it's always very difficult to uh, collect comparable data when you are trying to look at different countries around the world. Here there's the link if you want to go and have a look at the study and the results. Um, I'm just going to show you a little bit just also for fun as an introduction, what they found in terms of mobility of highly uh, skilled uh, and uh, people and scientists around the world. And then you maybe can, you know, even place yourself in one of these bars that I'm gonna show you in a second. So this study covers 16 core countries. There's the link, the list there going from Australia, Belgium, blah, 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 to UK and the US. 
they do not look at China as destination country. They don't have very good data. And this is probably the main problem of this study because as we all know, India and China are big in this exchange of scientists around the world. They do have India inside them. They also focus on specific fields because you do have to reduce the heterogeneity of your sample if you are doing such a large scale study. So they look at especially um, sciences fields, so biology, chemistry, herb, environmental science materials. The response rate was actually good. They almost, they had over 19,000 answers. Um, so over 35% response rate, they sent out over 47,000 uh, questionnaires. Okay, so this is important because this is true. Whether you look at international migration or you look at interregional migration, the more educated people are, the more mobile they are. I'll tell you later on what are some of the reasons uh, of this, but what they find, it's you know, what, what we found in interregional trends as well. Scientists are highly mobile, okay? And if you look at the US, for instance, where I did work for seven years, in 2009, 41.6% of PhDs working in a science or engineering occupation were born outside the US. Almost half of the PhD awarded in the US, 48%, were going either to temporary or permanent residents, but not citizens. They were not American to start with. And if you go even higher in terms of skills, so you're looking at postdocs, this 48 becomes 60%, right? These are large numbers. Moreover, there are also studies that prove that within the classes of these scientists, the most productive are also more mobile. So in a sense, uh, this kind of relationship between human capital and, and uh, mobility it repeats itself uh, even within an homogeneous group, the most productive are also more mobile. I just put this here, it's, again, it comes from this global SAI, SAI uh, survey. Uh, this is the uh, proportion of scientists that come from outside the country. Uh, now, you can see some patterns here, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you in a second what I think they are. First of all, um, the geography matters. So if you look at the, uh, at the survey, you find out that Germany provides a lot of people that go to Switzerland, right? It makes sense because they're bordering nations. So geography really, the closeness of one place to another, it's important. Or, uh, you know, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland as well provide uh, people, but basically that, that, that counts. Also, if you do have cultural and language ties, that helps as well why people from uh, Germany are going to Switzerland? Well, because they have a link also in terms of uh, languages, a language, even though they kind of, in this global size survey, they downplayed a little bit this um, language factor. Um, there are, of course, also uh, exception to this rule because the top country of origin for the, U the US is China. And for the UK, it's Germany and Italy. They don't really have common language or common ties. I mean, Italian in the UK are really many. This is again from the same survey. Uh, these are the countries ranked by the number of scientists abroad. And India is of course the biggest provider of scientists abroad, we kind of all know that. But there are other countries as well that provide a lot of people that go abroad. Right, so now going back to what I actually contributed the most, I uh, worked on the interregional graduate mobility. So on the global scale, you have a reallocation of human capital. But even within countries, you have large disparities. So I'm Italian. I told you I worked in the UK. If you think about just these two countries I'm very familiar with, both of them have a, has a huge north-south divide, right? Except it's reverse. So in Italy, a lot of... Uh, Human capital flows from the south to the north. In the UK, it flows from the north to the south, especially because the UK has this primate role of the city of London, right? So they will go there. It's really a, an economy within an economy, greater London. But they, they do have this, you know, a problem. Well, if you want to call it problem, for some people, it's not a problem. I think actually it is that you have this flow and these huge massive disparities north-south. 
Now, uh, up until 10, 15 years ago, maybe even a little bit more than that, 20 years ago, you really didn't have very good micro data, individual micro data. Even when I did my PhD, as I said, I started in 2000, um, there weren't very many countries that were producing individual data on the migration of these highly skilled people. The UK was in fact one of the first country that was collecting systematically data on student and graduate mobility. They were doing it thanks to this higher education statistical agency that was going to all the universities around the UK and collecting data from the, the, the students and the alumni and then systematize it and cleaning it up. The first database was created in 1995 and wasn't very good. Um, eventually, when I did my PhD, I started using data from 1998 onwards because at that point they were more reliable and more clean and the sample was bigger. But it's, uh, it's, right, it, it's not something that uh, was very extensive back then. Um, my database was so extensive, but also the technology back then was not as good as it is today. So I had like millions of observation, uh, just, you know, a little bit of an anecdote. I used to start my models running and then go for coffee for a couple of hours, because that is how long it took for the computer to spat out the results, because the computers were not up to the pace of the data that I had back then. Ever since then, um, a lot of other countries have started producing better micro data, individual data on these uh, student, graduate, highly skilled individuals. So um, last year, I published a book with um, an edited book with Jonathan Corcoran, which is actually from Australia. And the book was an attempt to look at different countries and look at the state of the art of the data that they have on this phenomenon. And here is the link, the list of the countries that we managed to cover. In fact, uh, out of all these countries, the one that really copied the UK questionnaire exactly the same is Australia. And that's why Jonathan uh, Corcoran was my co-author on this book, because we started working together when Australia was copying the UK and have the same questionnaire. The other countries have different data some better than others, but the point is that they all realize the importance of collecting individual data, right? Not to talk now, you know, I won't go into this detail, but now you have big data and maybe you can even get something from big data to study the um, movement of these um, highly skilled people. Right, so it's very difficult to classify a body of study when it comes to migration in general, including the migration of highly, highly skilled people, I think that the two big themes are causes or consequences. What are you inter interested in? You can't do both, right? It's too much. There are so many things to be looked at. So you can decide that you are focusing more on understanding why these people move, so the causes of it, or that you are more interested in finding out uh, once you have them in a region, what happens to that region? So you're looking at the consequences. Normally, if you're looking more on the side of the causes of graduate mobility, you either focus on the push and pull factor. So what it is that pushes them away from the origin and gets them into a destination, or a lot of uh, a big body of studies as well focuses on the mismatch between these highly human capital individuals and the labor market, because you don't have enough jobs for them. So that's why you are losing them in a sense. And linked to this, you also have a lot of contributions that are looking at their over-education as another reason why they have to leave. The south of Italy, again, would be a good example. We now have a lot of people that graduate, go into tertiary education, then there are no jobs. So either they settle for a job which is very low in terms of value, and so there is an over-education, or they leave. And most of them, because of the over-education, decide to leave. When you're looking at the consequences of, uh, of highly individual uh, mobility, the, the literature is not symmetric. I'm sure that the, when you think about graduate mobility, highly individual mobility, the one thing you always think is brain drain, because you know, it's what everybody's talking about, brain drain, brain drain, regional brain drain, national brain drain, but this is what they always talk about. 
When you talk about the consequences on the origin, this is pretty much what the literature is telling you. The consequences are negative and hence you talk about brain drain. When you look at the consequences on the destination, because we are looking at highly human capital individual, you think about positives, innovation, entrepreneurship, and so on. I'll show you that it's not always like that. There are also uh, negative consequences on the destination and positive, cons uh, sorry, positive, uh, positive consequences on the origin and negative consequences on the destination, even though mm, they don't talk much about that. And of course, then you can think about not only the consequences on the places, but the consequences on the people, so migrants and natives. Right. Okay, so we established graduates, highly human capital individual, highly educated, are a lot more mobile than the general population. Why? Well, first we have to recognize that there are two types of determinants, individual determinants or aggregate determinants. Let's start with the individual one. What is different between the graduates and the rest of the population? Of course, you say education, yes. But in which way education makes them more mobile? First of all, if you think about labor economics, after you do a lengthy investment in your own, right, in your own human capital, in your education, what you want to get is a good return for your investment. So that's the moment in which you are most willing to move to get the best job of your life, right? The second thing is because graduate students are normally younger, there are exceptions, but you know, I'm talking about in, on average, they're younger. Um, they have, first of all, more years to recoup their costs. So if you think about this discount uh, over time, right? You have like 40 years ahead of you. So it's more convenient for you to move. Second, you normally have more, less specific human capital and more generic human capital. So by specific human capital, uh, I don't know if you know what I mean, but it's the human capital the knowledge that you can apply only to a certain occupation or to a certain firm. The generic human capital, it's also called transferable skill in management. And it's what you can use in different occupation in different firms. When you are young, basically what you get, it's what you get from the university. You do have specific uh, knowledge as well, but a lot of what you learn in university, you can apply to different firms, different positions. When you start working in a firm, like for 10 years, you start knowing a lot more about the organization of that firm. You know which person to talk to if you need something. But this is not something you can transfer to another firm. It's very specific to the place where you work. So if you move, you lose that. You can't cash on that one. There are other two reasons. Uh, there are also lower psychological costs because if you are kind of younger, you might have less of family uh, ties, right? So you don't have kids or whatever, especially um, school age kids that might link you to a place. And you normally have lower migration costs. This is again an anecdote, but when I, I moved a lot in my life. When I was younger, I would just pack up my stuff and go. When I became a little bit older, like I'm now, last time I moved from the US back to Italy, I hired a moving company. I couldn't be bothered packing my own stuff. So in terms of also moving costs, real moving costs, of course they increase because they increase with age. If you think about other reasons why you do move a lot, you also have lower information costs. You are better in picking up information, say, from the internet. Um, people that don't have a lot of education find it more difficult to know, for instance, you know, something about Brazil. Or if I have to go to Brazil, even just for you know, a conference or whatever, I can find that information out of the internet and maybe even the network of people that I know. And generally, more educated people have less psychological costs. This makes us kind of feel a little bit kind of cold, you know, cold personalities, but that's not it. The reality is that the more educated you are, the less you have the tendency to rely on family and friends. You become more independent. So it's, it's in a good way that you are less attached to family and friends. Hence, you become more mobile. And the last thing that you have to consider is that there is some kind of path dependency in migration. Again, I can, I can talk about my own case because it applies very much. 
when they first um, uh, told me to go and study in the UK for the first time, I said, I'm not going. And then I moved to the UK, I stayed there. And then once I did it once, when, once I uprooted myself from the first initial uh, location, I kept on going. And that's called repeat migration, this kind of, you know, there is this idea of the perspicacious peregrinator. You do one jump, then you do another one, then you do another one, and you keep on going because it becomes easier and easier. You know you can survive once, and so, you know, you, you keep on going. Not all the graduates are the same. Again, this is something I've done with my great data in the UK. What we did, we were looking at the sequential migration of students and graduates. So we knew where they were living before um, going to university, most of them with their parents. So the initial location, we knew where they went to study and we knew the location of their first job. In fact, we had two surveys, one after six months and one more longitudinal, two and a half after graduation. And we had weights to compare the two so that the sample were comparable. And what I found out is that, of course, there are at least, there, there are five sequential migration behavior that you can have. The most migratory people migrate to go and study and then migrate again to a different place to go and work, right? The return migrants, they are often mentioned when you talk about circulation of brains, right? These are the people that go away, but then decide to go back home to work. Then for a lack of a better word, we have the university stayer, which are the people that move away, but then stay in that location to work. This is the human capital retention, right? The one that I would like to have at the GSSI, get people into study and then embed them into the local area. Then you have the late migrants, it's kind of the opposite. They, they are not brave enough to go and study away, but then they do so well at university, then they somehow uh, get the courage to move. And then you have finally the non-migrants, which are the stayers. They, don't, they always stay in the same location throughout their life. So once I classified them, I was interested in looking if there were, uh, if, if the people in this group were significantly statistically different from each other or not. And this is where a lot of interesting results came out. The first was that female graduates were a lot more dichotomous in their behavior than the male graduates, right? And now most of you that are connected, they are male. So if I say that you will all agree, in, in, if I say that women are more extreme, you will probably, all the male participants will probably nod and say, yeah, yeah, we know that female are more extreme. But that's what came out here. So either the female were repeat migrants, so if they moved, they moved again, or they were not moving at all. While the male graduates more, were more in the kind of uh, three categories in the middle. But most interesting, the repeat migrants and the late migrants tend to be the best students. In the case of the late migrants, it makes sense, right? Because you go to university in the local area, then you do so well, then you think, oh, should I stay here or try and get the best job I can, even if I have to enlarge my job search area? Repeat migrants, again, right? There is this uh, relationship between quality uh, and, and migration, so it makes sense. But what surprised me a little bit, I thought that probably the one that did the worst or with the lower human capital, the lowest human capital would be the non-migrants. But what came out actually is that at least in the case of the UK, the return migrants were the most problematic group because they were the one with the lowest grade at university. So I don't know if you know a little bit about the UK system, but first and to one are the two top grades. Two, two, and third are the top two grades, right? So people that did not do particularly well at university tended to go back home. And it was really back home because I had the data at postcode level. There are 4 million postcodes in the UK. And on average, in each postcode, you have 40 houses. So if they were not going back to live with their parents, they're going back to live very close to their parents anyway. So this was really a movement home. So it, in the case of the UK, it looked like it was more of a corrective movement. And something that then I kind of worked on later on in other article I had, I found that especially the one that were in arts were going back home. And then I had all this uh, uh, contribution later on on the, uh, what, what we called, and it was a provocation, the Bohemian graduates. 
right? Because we kind of, we started from these and see what was happening to these more artistic graduates. Right. On the regional determinants, there are, of course, a lot of regional determinants. I just want to point out a couple of things that I worked on. The, here, the intuition was that uh, the jobs for the highly educated one are more sparsely dispersed of, over the territory. So it's, it's kind of a combination of concentration and dispersal because they are more dispersed, right? You can't find, uh, like a bakery would be everywhere, a McDonald's would be everywhere. These are lower skilled jobs, right? And you can find them in your local area. If you want a very specific high human capital job, you do have to move and you have to move more. But they are also concentrated in specific locations. So while the assumption of uh, randomly distributed jobs over space that sometimes you use in theoretical model in labor economics is okay for lower human capital, it's not okay for higher human capital. It has more like this shape, which is larger, but also uh, not symmetric, and there is kind of an attractor that pulls that shape into a certain direction. So um, in 2013, we were trying to do something about that, and we came up with this paper, it was published in Papers in General Science, where we looked at the migration movement out of a different institution in the UK. I can't put the name of the institutions here because, you know, confidentiality reason, but trust me that this one is one of the most selective universities in the UK. We removed the people that stayed in the local area. We only looked at the migrants. And as you can see, um, by using this concept of circular um, variance, what you can see here is that this movement was pretty much very long in distance and unidirectional. They were all focusing on a certain labor market. At the opposite, this is a lower ranked university. These are all the students. We were not even looking at different subjects or whatever. This is a low ranked university. And you can see that the students go a little bit all over the places. So shorter in distance in terms of uh, miles, but also a little bit everywhere because the jobs that the higher ranked uh, university students, graduates were looking at are different in quality than the one of this university, which has more like a local development role rather than national development. Right, then I also had a student in the UK, uh, Catherine Dodzel, that looked of course at the role of uh, amenities in the migration of these um, people. And uh, it's kind of now uh, has been proven that the more highly skilled or higher educated you are, the more you also uh, value amenities kind of goes a little bit with income as well, right? I, I do um, look at amenities as uh, at least normal, if not superior goods. So you tend to care about amenities if you can afford it. So if you get a better job and you know you're gonna get a job that is highly paid, then also the consideration of your quality of life kicks in. If you're on a survival income, eh, maybe you look at amenities a little bit less because you can't afford it. All right, okay, that is for the causes. On the consequences of graduate migration, so this review that I wrote with two uh, of my previous students in 2017, is trying to kind of revive, review all the consequences of graduate migration on the origin and destination, as I told you before, and there is an asymmetry. So if you look at the destination, the majority of studies examining the consequences on the destination seems to be, um, rather positive, right? Um, however, so here this is this asymmetry. If you look at the destination and you have very high quality human capital in, then you only talk about uh, positive consequences. It's the opposite if you talk about like refugees, then they only focus about, of course, negatives and I don't look at any uh, positive whatsoever. What are some of these positive consequences? Normally, the ones that are cited are innovation or entrepreneurship. The positive complementarity with natives in the labor market, so this reflects in the in sometimes higher natives' wages, and then cultural and ethnic diversity. The idea of the innovation, basically, is that you bring these high human capital people in, you don't really have, so, 
this is the neoclassical growth model, right? Where everything equalizes at the end because if you get more people into a region, then the salaries go down, right? And then uh, the capital flows the other way around and at the end you have a long-term equilibrium. But this is assuming that the labor that flows, it's all the same quality. When you are actually looking at um, migration of graduates, you recognize that the people that actually move are the one with the highest human capital. And so what happens is not the long-term equilibrium, but it's a cumulative causation. You get these high-skilled migrants moving into this high-wage region. This high-wage region, which is already richer, gets more innovation, more growth, more demand for goods because these highly skilled people want more variety, more specific goods. So there is also an increase in demand that creates more jobs. So at the end, you have a larger divide between the poorest and the richest region. There are a lot of contributions that looked at this relationship between innovation and human capital. I wrote one in 2009, which was looking at this interregional uh, interrelationship between migration flows and regional innovation. Uh, there is another one, uh, but, but in this contribution, I had to use patents data. I'm not going to go into the problems with patents, but patents have a lot of problems, let's say. In, they are still used as a proxy for innovation, but they're not perfect by any means. But they're often the only data you have available, so you use them anyway. In 2015, Gagliardi used the Community Innovation Survey. These uh, uh, surveys normally have uh, more detailed information on the type of innovation that is introduced, and they give you also a better sense of innovation in uh, services, okay? So she found, again, that skill immigration was linked to innovation, but especially process innovation more than product innovation. This is what she finds. Um, other contributions. Uh, this is an interesting one because they find out that if you increase uh, the 1% share in a state share of immigrants, college graduates, 1% will increase the state's patenting rate by 6%. I haven't found any other contribution with similar results of this magnitude, but if this is True, it's actually quite significant increase. Um, and then this other contribution, uh, let me just mention the one by Michaela Tripoli in 2013. Uh, she also mentioned this follower phenomenon, which is a little bit like a cumulative causation or beaten path in uh, the movement of scientists in the sense that you move one or two and then they can even create a critical mass to attract more people in so that, you know, once you get started, you might end up with having more and more of them into a region. Okay, native wages. The people that talk about positive consequences of this uh, highly skilled migration believe that there is a higher, a very high complementarity between these people coming in and the natives. If the people that come in create innovation, create jobs, uh, they have specific skills that complement the ones of the people that you already have in the system, then they don't steal the native jobs. In fact, they create more jobs for them and you know, the supply and demand uh, typical framework in labor economics, you might end up having even a higher wage for the natives. This is pretty much, there are two schools here in the US, uh, lots of people writing about that, but the two that started this debate were pretty much David Card versus uh, George Borjas. George Borjas thinking that the immigrants are substitute to uh, natives, irrespective of the skill level, even these highly skilled individuals. And of course, the other one is David Card that thinks that there are a lot of complementarities between the two groups. The last thing, which is, you know, kind of uh, accepted, it's that if you bring people in, highly skilled people, you know, coming from other countries, you increase ethnic and cultural diversity. So here there is more of a, uh, there is an efficiency, let's say, and an equity thing, or a moral versus an economic reasoning. Morally, 
a lot of people think that increasing uh, ethnic and cultural diversity is good, right? It's good because it opens up your mind, it puts you in contact with different values, you know, makes you more flexible. On the economic point of view, they also point out that there is also an increased opportunity to create new goods, right? So, you, I don't know, you, you start having Chinese restaurants in Italy, for instance, or so on, right? So, in general, this is seen as a positive thing that you have more of a diversity rather than all the people being the same. Uh, Okay, so negative consequences of highly skilled uh, migration. They're kind of difficult to think of, right? But if you actually sit there for a while and think about it, you realize that there are some. The first is, if you have an inelastic supply of a good, clear example is housing, right? And you move these highly educated people into an area these high educated people have a very high income and so they can afford the houses, the houses can get better, but then you might um, end up crowding out the people who were already there and maybe they cannot afford the house anymore because now you have all these highly educated people coming in. Somebody asked me a few months ago, in fact a journalist, do you think that L'Aquila now that you have all these uh, doctoral students and whatever will become an elitarian city? I don't think there is this uh, risk yet, but you never know, right? 10 years from now, if we bring all these people in, we might eventually crowd out uh, um, people with a lower income and older maybe, and with lower education. So you have to think about this as well. And the second is of course, what I told you before, this idea of Borjas, he doesn't believe that there are complementarities, even when you talk about high skill immigrants, because that, substitutable to, to the high skilled natives. So he's not so sure that uh, there is a positive effect on wages. Right, when you talk about the origin, negative consequences, well, I don't have really to talk much about the brain drain, I guess, because it's everywhere. In Italy, we are very worried about the brain drain, people that went to the UK. Now Brexit is helping us a little bit because they want to leave the UK, but still, um, we are worried about that. The brain drain is basically the depletion of a country or a region, human capital. If you, if you transfer this skill, this human capital to another region, you paid for the education of these people, right? So the Italian government paid for most of the education, tertiary education. We only have very few private universities, so most of them are public. So the Italian government effectively pay paid for their training and now they're going and work and benefit another economy. So it's effective, it's a, it's a huge loss of money. But this brain drain relies on one assumption, which is that the pre-stock migration, the pre-stock, um, pre-migration, sorry, stock of human capital in the origin, it's exogenous to international migration. Right? But now, some studies have questioned that. Because imagine that you know that if you study, you can migrate to the US, for instance, right? Oh, sorry, you are in Mexico, and you know that if you study a lot, there is a chance that you can get a job in the US. And also suppose that the salary gap between the US and Mexico is very high. It might as well be right? There aren't very many, um, this is a theoretical contribution, there aren't very many empirical contribution yet on these, but if that's the case, uh, you might have, the people in Mexico might have an incentive to go and study because they see this possibility in the future. So if the pre-migration stock of human capital, it's endogenous, right, to the prospect uh, of migrating, then maybe Mexico can have some benefits. Not all of these people migrate. Some of the people that wouldn't have studied otherwise if there wasn't this possibility are now staying in Mexico. So the average level of education in Mexico is, is growing. So this is just an example. I don't know what's happening in Mexico or in the US, but I can tell you that in the case of Italy, for instance, this was happening in the south of Italy 
a lot of um, people were actually studying with this prospect of moving to Milan, to the north, to get a good job. Okay, other positive consequences for the origin, of course, remittances. These are often quoted even for general uh, migration, except highly skilled migrants tend to remit less. So it looks like the more educated you are, the more stingy you are. So that's not good, I guess. Uh, the second is return migration. Uh, again, uh, you want to get people abroad to study and then back home. And if you can do that, then they can have a lot of effect on your economy, except that you have to understand, as I said before, whether return migration is a corrective movement or not. If it's a corrective movement and you get the worst back because they couldn't find a job in the country where they migrated, then that's an issue. And of course, the creation of networks. If you get a lot of, say, Chinese in the US, maybe you can get more international trade between the two countries, just a stupid example, right? And knowledge diffusion, because then these people are trained, they have very high skill, then they can kind of you know, talk to people back home, so there is a process of knowledge diffusion. This is a contribution of Cambur and Rappaport. He talks about diaspora externalities, which is what I've just talked about, and this growth effect of the brain drain. And he has a very formalized model where he's showing you that if the salary gap between origin and possible destination is large enough, then the effect on the origin, human capital, it's, it's important. It's not just small. I don't know how I'm doing with time. Okay. Uh, I'm almost done anyway. So uh, on the individual my Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've been told that you would have to leave at, at 3.30. So um, if you want to wrap up, that would be great because we would like to open it for questions. If possible, yeah, yeah. If yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just very, I'm, I'll go very quickly here. Just to say that uh, the consequences of individuals were if you didn't have any positive right? You wouldn't migrate. If you are a rational individual, uh, then you, there is all this migration because there are some advantages for the migrants. Again, I have this contribution with Sarah Jewell in which we were looking at the different uh, uh, return on migration behavior. And we found that uh, if you are repeat migrants, you have the highest uh, uh, return on your migration behavior, followed by delayed migration, which is almost 7%. Again, return migration, not only it wasn't positive, it was actually negative. So there was a salary penalty of about 1.4%, meaning that uh, rather than become a failed migrant and become a return migrant, uh, being a non-migrant was a preferable option, at least for the UK. Uh, aside from the wages, of course, uh, you also have a better matching of your abilities, which in turn ref is reflected in a higher career satisfaction. In this contribution of 2015, not only we had the salaries, we also had the reported satisfaction and it increases with migration, meaning that you might have a better matching aside from the return. Okay, very quickly. So winners and losers. There are winners and losers. This is Europe. These are data from the OECD 2018. Uh, when you look at human capital migration in Europe, uh, you can see that there are winners and losers. There is a huge north-south divide. So if you look at Italy, you know, very light, <laughs> the UK, very dark, and so are the Nordic countries. They actually get, they are net receivers of highly human capital. But going back to Italy one second, so these are finer data. I had provinces here, which are not three. And we found that these are just tertiary educated migrants. And you can see the red, areas are losing, the green areas are winning, while Milan is over there, uh, where the green is. Again, you can see that there is a flow from south to north. Slightly less in 2011, but here, remember that there was the crisis of 2009. So again, it can be that even the north of Italy was kind of in a crisis, so they weren't moving because they couldn't find jobs even in the, in the north or they're moving abroad, and here they're not recorded. Last thing I want to say, and maybe we can open the discussion on that. 
So the, what is the real policy problem? The real policy problem is you need human capital to grow, okay? You know how these are flowing. Uh, what do we do with more peripheral areas? It's a very complex problem, right? But we need to, well, a lot of people, me included, believe that you need to try and attract these very highly educated people in intermediate or more peripheral areas for this area to not die completely. Otherwise, they will all go to the cities and then, okay, you solve the problem of the city, congestion and so on, and you let this other area die. It's a choice. I don't think that you should let all these people, all these area die because of the cultural diversity, heritage, but also because at least the intermediate areas, not the very peripheral one, but the intermediate area, I think they have potential. Conclusions, and I'm done. So human capital is one of, if not the most important ingredient in local development. However, highly educated people are more mobile generally, so they move a lot. You have to understand why they move. And uh, for that, you need a wider availability of micro data. We now have some good data, but I think we need even more. We also know more or less what are the consequences on the local economy. However, we still have the problem with this human capital depletion of areas that are not urban. And it has worsened with the crisis. So we have to think about what we want to do in this respect. I'm done. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. So um, now we open the floor for questions, comments on, on the presentation or anything you, you would like to discuss and ask Alessandra, please feel free. Anybody who hasn't uh, a, a microphone or isn't working um, can just type the questions into the chat as well. someone is typing or not well Alessandra, um sorry i was trying to get to the chat but i can't see yeah so um depending on what uh, device you're using I'm, I'm using a tablet you have to like click twice to get uh, this, this okay button. okay so okay i got so you go to the chat and there's a chat button okay i think i got it um, so I, I have a very technical question. Uh, perhaps I'll just yeah. start and perhaps people jump in. Um, uh, so scientists are highly mobile and you, you had a slide there like the most productive are the most mobile. Uh, productivity uh, for scientists uh, measured in what? In, in, in publications or what did you use? Yes, there? this is what they were using. In that particular case, they were looking at publications. I don't remember if they also had something on uh, other outcome of the research but they were especially looking at publications, yes. There is also another contribution actually that looks at the um, cross citation between publications. It, it was not the same author and they were uh, basically saying that they had more citations, more cross citation because move, by moving around, they were creating more of a network, but they were looking at publication in that, in that for the scientists, yes. Okay, thanks. And, and perhaps a, a little provocation. Um, I, I work with ecology, so my, I'm an ecological economist, and um, I just read like this week uh, an article where uh, they were saying you have to, um, you know, basically leave half of the planet uh, surface um, alone, um, you know, depopulate, uh, you know, concentrate on, on the urban development, the cities, and, and leave nature to itself. So we need like 50% of the planet, of the um, land mass. Um, uh, in, in a native state, so to say, uh, to, to give it space, to give Earth a space to regenerate, um, to, you know, uh, and, and exactly, you know, overcome all the um, externalities, the side effects of development. Um, so uh, I'm obviously working with alternatives to development. <laughs> so, um, do we really want to, um, to have like all these intermediate regions um, uh, and wouldn't be a good idea to to draw people to the urban centers, make cities more sustainable, and then you know, I mean, I can talk about Germany, where I'm from. Um, there's the the northeast of Germany, like all the area around not north of Berlin, uh, close to Poland, to the Polish um, uh, border. People are just leaving, so there's nothing there, and um, it's beautiful for holidays. You can have you know amazing lakes, and in summer it's warm, even so you can swim. Um, 
I'm not sure if it's if we need these regions to be populated and to have scientists there and to have people there stop just to, to provoke people a bit of, about you know these um, these factors and if, if, if it's so then um, perhaps we don't even need to intervene Okay, so it, my background, I didn't tell you that, but actually my background uh, at university, I studied environmental economics. <laughs> so, okay, just, and I, in fact, my thesis, my bachelor thesis was an environmental impact assessment. And then I moved more into regional and whatever, labor and regional. Okay, so I think that that's a very good question. And I'm not sure if there is an answer, which is, uh, we should all move to cities or we should all be dispersed. I actually think, and this applies to a lot of problems, that the middle solution is normally what you want. Because if you concentrate all the people in large cities, are you absolutely certain that you can compensate for things like congestion? All the negative externalities, they would become massive, right? Think about, I don't know, Beijing, for instance, or all these Chinese cities where the, the pollution is incredible. So, Sure, you're telling me, why don't we just compensate for these negative externalities? Yes, but are we sure that the negative externalities are not growing exponentially, but they're growing linearly? Because if they're growing linearly, maybe you can do something about that. But if they're, they're growing exponentially with the largest concentration, then you might do more harm in getting all, all them concentrated in one area than actually getting dispersed. On the on the actual intermediate and peripheral areas, I think we should have a triage, you know, like when you go to hospital and you have the red code, mm, these are already dead more or less, and then you have the yellow one, right? Okay, and then you have the green one. So the cities are our green one, right? And then you have the yellow one. Okay, so if you have to invest, you have to be selective and pick some areas that might actually be good investing in, they wouldn't have a lot of negative externalities, they would have a lot of potential, pro production potential. I'm not suggesting that all the green spaces, which are my kind of, you know, red code, where they are already kind of depopulating, all of them should be populated. So I guess I'm not thinking about a uniform distribution of population throughout the whole world. But I'm not sure that to solve even the ecological problem, the sustainability problem, having just peaks, but very high peaks, would help either. I don't think so. But again, open to debate, I think we do have to find, for instance, if we, do, if we improve a lot the abatement technology for like pollution or whatever, right? If we get an alternative to cars in cities or then of course, then maybe concentration is the way to, to go. But think about then all these people that are concentrated there, wherever they have to move, they have to use the car. <laughs> because then you have like jumps from one area to the other. Uh, I don't know, I guess it's, it's different. Is there some discussion? Sorry, I'm just reading. I go. Is there some discussion or evidence on economic shocks and crisis being push factor affecting this migration? I was wondering whether induced migration of high school or my damage the resilience yeah so yes um there are studies that are looking exactly at that um and um, now i can't quote any particular study but i've been so i've seen some working papers for instance in italy where they're exactly saying this that the shock was asymmetric in the north and the south of italy so italy was affected by all of Italy was affected by the shock and a lot and again and again. So we had a double dip, we had the triple dip almost, right? We are not in, in good health right now as an economy, but the North was affected less than the South. So the people from the South were still moving either to the North or abroad. And so the gap increased because of the shock. It obviously depends on what kind of activities you have. And normally during a recessionary shock, the weakest sectors <coughs> are the ones that are affected the most. Depends what kind of shock, actually. So the 2009 shock was a financial shock. So initially the cities were affected, like Milan was affected. But then this was a particular financial shock. When the shock spread in 2012 and whatever, it became a, a real economic shock. Then manufacturing was affected and manufacturing was more in peripheral areas. So, 
it depends on the type of shock. It depends on the, the um, structure of the economy. But in general, the weaker you are, the more you are affected. Hence, people are moving out. Thank you, uh, Alessandra. So are there any further questions? Um, we are already like uh, a little bit late. Usually we have um, our 60 minute webinar. Today we started a bit late, so it's- uh, Yeah, yeah. It's, it's for now. Huh. If there are no further questions, um, comments. You can always send me an email if the question comes to mind later on, okay? My email is in the slide, so you can see it. <laughs> Yes. Oh, uh, for everybody, this is um, this session is being recorded, so this is uh, uh, automatically up uploaded to the YSD to the Young Scholar Directory um, immediately after we close the session. So you can access there, see the slides uh, Alessandra put up. So um, yeah, uh, feel free to to um, uh, access these resources we we have. So there are no further questions. I would like to thank you, Alessandra. Uh, excuse me. And thank you. For your participation. Um, and the attention. So um, uh, I, I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk from Alessandra and I uh, hope to hear more from you in the future. Thank you very much. Enjoy your careers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good luck in Italy. Bye Thank bye, you. everyone. Bye. bye, -bye.